By the end of this video, you will know what cameras are worth your money, what specs and features you actually need in your camera, and most importantly, how to save money on your camera without sacrificing quality. Let's get into it. Also, I'll leave links down below for my favorite cameras that I recommend you guys check out. So the first thing we need to decide is who is this camera for and what is this camera for? What are you going to be shooting with this camera and what is the purpose and use of those photos and videos? And depending on your answer, you're going to fall into one of three categories. Number one is the fun, casual, non-professional shooter. You're going to want a fun experience with your camera. You want something relatively small that's easy to take around with you and you want your camera to be simple and easy to use and you do care about image quality, but you're not really pixel peeping. But above all, you wanna make sure your camera is affordable and fits your budget. And number two is the artist, creative, semi-professional shooter. You probably don't care about how big or small your camera is. What you do care about is the ease of use and if your camera helps you be creative or not. You do care about image quality and you will be editing your photos and videos, but above all else, you want your camera to be affordable in a way that it doesn't break the bank, but you don't want the cost of that affordability to be reliability. You want your camera to work under most conditions. And number three is the pro artist serious shooter type that's definitely making money with their camera and they really want the best of the best. For you guys, reliability is probably number one. You want good build quality. You don't want your camera to struggle with overheating or different shooting environments. You really want your camera to be top notch. Image quality definitely matters to you and you will definitely be editing your photos and videos, but you also want the highest resolution and the best looking sensor. And you probably realize the camera you want is going to be expensive, but you want to make sure you get the best value for your money in whatever you're buying. So in order to find the right camera for you, depending on what category you fit in, we're going to be going over all of the major parts of a camera. And the further down this list we go, the more important these features become. So make sure you stay until the end. So the first thing we want to talk about is the sensor and processor. Your sensor is that little guy right there. And your processor is essentially the brain that determines what your sensor is capable of. Now, some of you might know that a sensor is made of millions of little megapixels which capture your image, but a lot of people wrongly assume that the higher the number of megapixels you have, the better your sensor is. That is simply not true. Instead, you should look at these other things on your sensor first. The first one being the size. Sensors come in a large variety of sizes, the most common ones being full frame, APS-C, micro four thirds, or one inch sensors. Generally, the larger your sensor, the more expensive your camera will be, but by having a larger sensor, you're also going to get a few other advantages. And sensor size is often better than sensor resolution. So for that reason, most shooters should only be looking at APS-C or full frame cameras. Micro Four Thirds is probably a waste of your time unless you're picking that camera up for literally pennies on the dollar. And if you get a one inch sensor, it should only be in a cell phone, a point and shoot camera or an action camera. By having a larger APS-C or full frame sensor, you're also going to get better low light performance, which almost all of us need. And by having a larger sensor, you're also going to get a wider field of view that looks more cinematic and looks closer to pro camera quality. Now, the other thing to consider is that if you're shooting in low light or very specific lighting environments, like being on a cinematic film set for a music video or short film, megapixels do matter, but they matter to video shooters and photo shooters in very different ways. A 20 to 24 megapixel sensor is the new camera minimum, and this is really the sweet spot for resolution and price. This will give you plenty of detail to zoom in, crop into your images without breaking the bank. And 20 to 24 megapixels is actually enough for 4K video. And in some cameras, you can even record up to 6K video with the same resolution. If you're doing photos, I recommend something between 33 to 45 megapixels. This is going to give you a lot of room to push into your image and fix up even the smallest detail in your photos. But if you're shooting video, a high resolution sensor can often force you to compromise on the quality of your video. And for that reason, a lot of times video shooters actually prefer a lower resolution sensor like eight megapixels or 12 megapixels. So if you're someone that shoots both photos and videos, 24 and 26 is actually the sweet spot for you. This way you get great photos and video without compromising. Two really good examples being the Sony FX30 and also the Canon R6. So it's really important to know what you need from your sensor based on your type of shooting and whether you're doing photos and videos. 
Otherwise, you're going to be bottlenecked by your sensor and you may not get the camera you actually want. Also, when looking at your camera, ISO and low light might be really important for you, especially if you find yourself constantly shooting in dimly lit environments or just challenging lighting conditions. If you're a casual shooter, you simply need to make sure your camera has an onboard flash, and this is going to be essential to get nighttime photography. But if you don't wanna use a flash, or if you're going to be doing video, you wanna look for a camera that has a dual native ISO or a dual base ISO. You simply wanna to go to Google, type in the name of your camera, and type in dual base ISO or dual native ISO right after this. This will tell you if your camera has that feature. This simply allows your camera to shoot at both a low ISO, like 800, for regular everyday shots, and then a high ISO, like 12,800, for low light shooting. A really good example is a Sony FX3, Sony ZV-E1, or the Canon R6 Mark II that are all really good in low light. Now, if you're a casual shooter that does not plan to edit their photos and videos, you wanna make sure your camera has good colors. Two brands that have really good colors are Fuji and Canon. Sony is catching up, and I would say Sony is like a little bit below Canon and Fuji, but these camera brands have the best colors and will allow you to get really good photos and videos without any editing. But if you fall into the other two categories of artist or a pro, you actually don't need to care about your colors. The slight difference in your original colors will not make a huge difference to you in the long run when you edit your photos and videos. If you're a photographer, you want to look for something that has 14-bit RAW or 16-bit RAW. And there are some older cameras that have 12-bit RAW. I would stay away from them. It's going to make a very big difference. If you're a video shooter, you want to think about codecs and log profiles. A codec is the file type that your video footage is recorded in, and you want to look for a higher megabit codec anywhere between 200 to 600 megabits per second. Anything below that, you're not going to get a good video camera, especially not one that you can edit later. And on top of that, you also wanna look for a camera with log profiles. Different cameras have different log profiles, like Sony has S-Log, Canon has C-Log, Fuji has F-Log, as you can guess. It's basically the name of the camera brand, the first letter, and then log after it. But you wanna make sure it has some sort of log profile or flat profile. This is going to give you more room to play with because these profiles have such a desaturated colors and basically don't do anything to the video footage when it's coming out of your camera. This way you have more room to add more stuff to the video footage without having to fight the built-in colors. Now let's talk about what I think is the most important part of your camera, even more important than the sensor, and that is your shooting speed and frame rates. Your shooting speed is basically how many photos a second your camera can take, and your frame rate is how many frames per second your video is actually shooting at. For casual shooters that don't need to shoot a lot of action, anywhere between five to eight frames per second will be perfectly fine. If you can get a camera with 10 frames per second, you're going to be even happier, but this is really the sweet spot for most people, five to eight frames per second. Now, if you're capturing fast moving action like sports, wildlife, or just your crazy kids or dogs that will not sit still for like two seconds so you can get an Instagram post, you know what I'm talking about. But for you guys, you want something closer to 10 to 12 frames per second, even 15 frames per second, this way you can get all of the action, even the parts that you don't want, and you can go in there later and pick the exact photo that you want. But for some of you guys that want to shoot really, really fast, you should look for a camera anywhere between 20 frames per second to 40 frames per second. This is actually faster than regular video, and this is going to make sure you never miss your shot. But this feature of shooting 20 to 40 frames per second is only available in mirrorless cameras and not DSLRs. Now, if you're shooting video, it's actually a lot simpler. You simply wanna be able to record 4K or full HD resolution, and you wanna get 24 or 30 frames per second for regular real-time action. But if you're someone that also wants to do slow motion video, you wanna look for a camera that does 60 frames per second or 120 frames per second without a crop. And this is why the sensor is so important, because your sensor resolution is too high, you're going to get slow motion with a crop, but for something like the Sony ZV-E1 or the Sony FX3, by having a 12 megapixel sensor can actually record 4K video up to 120 frames per second. One thing to keep in mind when shooting slow motion video, you wanna make sure your camera still records in a high bit rate codec when shooting slow motion. A lot of cameras will shoot really good regular 24 and 30 frames per second video, but will absolutely give you crap video when shooting slow motion. You wanna make sure it's still shooting a high bit rate codec. Now, if you're going to be shooting a lot of photos or videos, whether there's movement or not, the one thing that people often forget is the autofocus. Now, autofocus is one of those things that does not get the hype and respect that it deserves. If you're shooting a lot of photos and videos and they're not in focus, they're not really usable. 
With autofocus, it's pretty simple. It either works or it doesn't, but there's different features to look for inside of autofocus to make sure you're getting one that's right for you. And there's also a new technology called AI-based autofocus that you should look for that makes autofocus a lot easier for you. So to keep it simple, let's make a list of companies that do autofocus the best. At the very top of this list is Sony. They have a lot of money to throw out their autofocusing system because they do so much outside of cameras. For this reason, they've built an actual AI-based autofocusing system that can intelligently recognize if it's looking at a person, plane, animal, insect, car, and will even intelligently block out other subject matter when it's shooting. This way you could literally walk in front of the camera and the autofocus will not struggle. Right behind them is Canon. Canon is still really, really good, but they don't have quite the same features as Sony, but I would say Canon is 10 out of 10 still. Sony is just like 12 out of 10, but both of these autofocusing systems are really good and you simply cannot go wrong. In third place, you have Nikon cameras. The Nikon mirrorless cameras have done a really good job with autofocusing. They also have AI-based autofocus that can intelligently track subject matter like birds, people, cars, but it's not quite as fast in terms of algorithm tracking as Canon and Sony are. They're still really good and there's reasons to get a Nikon camera. The autofocusing, I would say is like eight out of 10. Right behind them is Fuji. Fuji does a really good job with their autofocus. In photo mode, it's very reliable. Well, I do find it struggles a little bit in video mode, but the biggest thing about Fuji camera and their autofocus is you wanna make sure you have the right lens for it because the autofocus heavily depends on whether you have a lens that is also good for autofocus. And in dead last is Panasonic. They honestly have the worst autofocus. It sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. It's known to be finicky. It's not a camera you get for autofocus, although the Lumix and Panasonic cameras are still good for certain types of shooters. Also, one thing to consider, if you're getting a mirrorless or an old school DSLR, you wanna look at what the coverage of the autofocus system is. Some of the older cameras only cover the center point of the sensor and some cameras cover all of the sensor. You wanna make sure you have enough autofocus points that cover the part of the sensor that you need. All right, let's finally talk about the most uncomfortable part of cameras and that is the size. Bigger isn't always better. You wanna make sure you have the size that's right for you. Sounds dirty, but I don't mean it to. But here's the thing, a lot of times people look at big bulky cameras and go, yeah, that's a professional camera. But the truth is, this actually has as much resolution as this camera. Size doesn't matter, but what you should think about when it comes to size is, is this camera going to have all the buttons and dials and the feel that I want from my camera? A larger camera like the Nikon D850 is going to have a button or dial or flip switch somewhere for every little setting I need. It literally has one dial to change different autofocus mode, one dial to go between photo and video, but a smaller camera like this might not have the same buttons and dials. It may not be as flexible in terms of setting up custom buttons like the Nikon D850 is. So when you're going with a bigger camera, it's generally for professional use, mainly to make your life easier, not because it's a better camera. Another thing to think about is the screen. Now, some cameras like this have a flip out screen that comes out to the side so you can see yourself, but some cameras like the Fuji X-C5 only has a screen that tilts up and down. And this may not be right for everybody. So you wanna make sure that you have the screen that is right for you. I don't think it's really worth your time to think about if the screen is a high resolution or a low resolution. It's a screen, you're just using it to check if you're in focus, check your composition, all that stuff. I would never use any screen, even on the highest professional cameras, to check my exposure, but really you just wanna make sure you have the screen that is right for your shooting ergonomics. Other than that, the screen never matters and I do not recommend paying for a nice screen. Now, one of the most important things that people forget about when picking their camera in terms of design is the lens mount. You could have the nicest, highest resolution sensor in your camera, but if you don't have a good lens for it, it's not going to look good. For that reason, you wanna make sure whatever camera system you buy has an open lens mount. An open lens mount basically means you can put third-party lenses on your camera. This way, you can get cheaper lenses from third party that maybe aren't quite as fancy, but you can get a cheaper lens, or you can get really high-end lenses that are even better than the ones your camera manufacturer makes for your camera. This way, the more freedom you have, the better your images will look, and the more options you have for what kind of lenses you choose. Canon, however, does not have an open lens mount, neither does Leica, neither does Hasselblad. They say it's because they have the best lenses, but, I want freedom. Another thing you wanna be on the lookout for when picking up a camera is battery life and overheating. 
The smaller these cameras get, the hotter they get, but a lot of times they will actually shut down if they overheat. So you wanna make sure you do a quick search to make sure your camera doesn't have any overheating problems. And in terms of battery life, depending on what camera you pick, sometimes even the smallest, slimmest cameras will have a big battery life depending on what type of battery they use. So you wanna do a quick search for what kind of batteries your camera uses, and if it's a big battery, it's going to last a lot longer. But for video shooters, a lot of you guys should actually get V-Lock batteries and tap them into your camera. This way, you get good battery life no matter what. So based on everything we talked about today, you guys now know how to find your perfect camera based on the specs you need and at the price point you need. I'll also be answering all of your questions down below, so hit me up in the comments, and I'll also be leaving a list of cameras in the links down below that I think are really worth checking out. So if you're kind of confused on what camera to pick up, make sure to check out that list, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.